from? I don't know. It's just a joke to lighten the mood in the newsletter. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You've been here before. For those who didn't listen to the first one, because they're dumb, uh, start from, real quick, kind of two-minute recap, what you did pre Bitcoin, pre uh, becoming the Bitcoiners <laughs> everywhere. I don't know. Voice of Bitcoiners everywhere is a little... Sup, freaks. Sup, freaks. Um, yeah, so I uh, I found Bitcoin in college. I was studying economics at DePaul University in Chicago. And while I was in college uh, studying economics, I worked for a managed futures fund. And we were a fund of fund, so uh, we indexed CTA traders predominantly into in uh, a suite of funds. And my job there was an analyst in some of the markets that uh, the CTAs that were were indexing traded were currency markets, and that may, meant I had to follow uh, Fed tea leaves and central bank in the world. And so, uh, early on in college, uh, I sort of found Bitcoin and was studying it, and at the same time working at this fund, uh, having to write commentaries on why our fund was performing against market movements, and so I had to know why currencies were moving the way they were which meant reading a lot of Fed policy. And over the course of three years of working at this fund, I sort of realized that the Fed had no idea what it was doing. Uh, I was getting more down the Bitcoin rabbit hole and uh, sort of found Bitcoin in that way. I decided to uh, leave the fund uh, about a year and a half after college um, to go learn about UX, UI design. I was very infatuated with tech and the whole space, so I wanted to go learn how apps were made. So I decided to learn uh, via design first. Um, so I took a digital design boot camp designation. I think they were recently bought by Lambda School um, in Chicago, and that was the summer 2014. And I moved here to New York in uh, s like late summer 2014, and then got a job at a software company to learn about the back end of uh, app development and stuff like that. So I learned the whole code stack behind the design. Uh, and then after about two years there, I uh, decided to quit because I thought I was going to be able to get a job as a product manager. But apparently, uh, if you haven't built anything, getting a job as a product manager is pretty hard. So I had uh, a little stint of unemployment there. But the whole time, I was still um, learning about Bitcoin, studying Bitcoin. And then about a year in unemployment, year and a half in unemployment, I decided uh, uh, to start the newsletter, The Bent, it was uh, June 2017, uh, markets were going crazy as you, uh, quote unquote, crypto markets were going crazy as we're running into the, the run up of the bull market then. So I had a bunch of friends, family, reaching out, emailing, texting me. I, hey, you're a psycho. Like, what do you know about this? <laughs> yeah. You're the Bitcoin guy. Like, what's going on? Like, should we buy all this? Should we buy Ripple? Should we buy IOTA? I was like, oh, God, no. Um, My one claim to fame from 2017. I've never taken my victory lap, but I'm going to take it right now. Is on the one you ever seen the CNBC video of uh, Brian Kelly on TV with two you know two dollar fifty cent XRP being yeah. like here's the order book here's how easy it is going to Paul Aniex here's how you buy it. So uh, I was sitting at my buddy's apartment in Raleigh, North Carolina, and uh, we were drinking before we were about to go out, and I think he had it on like TiVo or like you know CNBC or whatever, and uh, it played. And I lost it. I was like, wait, what just happened? And I was like, rewind, play that back. No way. I just saw what I think I just saw. Played it a second time. We were like crying in laughter. Rewind it a third time, and I videoed it on my phone. And I just couldn't help myself. I was like, this is absurd. I tweeted it. And I woke up the next day, and I was like, man, I really like Brian. But like, <laughs> <laughs> Take that victory lap. And no, but like every once in a while now, people will retweet it. And they're just like, dude, two dollars and fifty cents was a while ago. Yeah, what's it at now? Like thirty cents, if that? I don't even know. I don't know. I I, we're, we're not going to make price. this an XRP hate session. We're 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 all friends on the internet today, kind of. <laughs> um, all right, so we're the first thirty-three thousand blocks. What? <laughs> 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 what what happened with the? Uh, uh, what did you do at Barcelona? What, what was that experience like? Um, that was a crazy experience. It was a relatively short-lived experience, but a crazy, uh, very grateful that I had the opportunity to work there, especially at the time that I did. Um, yeah, so I started the newsletter in June of 2017 and then noticed 
uh, a person who's a, somebody who's a person non grata at Barstool now. Uh, my buddy Lewis was tweeting uh, at Stoolies that they should be buying Ethereum, and I DM'd him like, uh, and this was when Ethereum was like approaching twelve hundred dollars, and I was like, kindly like, we should Chill. meet up. You shouldn't be uh, pumping this stuff to to the Stoolies, especially like at this point in the bull market. So we met up for some drinks just to talk about the space and he's infinitely fascinated by it and he convinced me to start the podcast and so that summer we started uh brainstorming about the podcast and uh started recording at barstool's offices and this was before uh, i started working there i was still unemployed looking for a job and i was lucky to be able to do the content stuff while i was unemployed and sort of just I was always hanging around the Barstool offices at the, that point, and Lewis needed a, an account manager on his podcast ad sales team, so I took that job and um, basically, yeah, was able to get a front row seat to the rocket ship growing, and they were t- hitting a takeoff speed, uh, and at the same time, uh, Bitcoin and crypto markets were going crazy, so I was the the Bitcoiner in the room telling everybody to stop, don't buy Chain, don't buy IOTA. <laughs> Um, I, I was on the rundown a couple times. Uh, it was a crazy uh, fall winter that I spent there. I was only at Barstool for like eight months, but it was an incredible experience. And I really admire what they do and what Dave Portnoy in particular has done to slowly but surely build a brand over time. And as you know, we were talking about it incredible. earlier. They were on the NASDAQ yesterday <laughs> flexing. So, <laughs> My favorite part of uh, yesterday was probably Dave in the suit and tie and Big Cat in like his bomber jacket. And I was <laughs> just, just like dabbing on them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the, the crazy thing about Barstool, I think, is just they've done what a lot of people previously have tried to do. Uh, they never veered from we're just going to tell you what we think. Right. Like a lot of people tried that. And then when they get the backlash, they kind of cave to it. They backtrack. They apologize, whatever. And like these guys just they were like, look, no, yeah, this they, is what we believe. They lean into it, which works and has worked for them for some time. And then on top of that, again, uh, we like to talk about time preference a lot in the Bitcoin world. And mm-hmm. Dave is somebody I think uh, exemplifies a low time preference, handing out papers starting in 2014. Incredible slowly building the blog over time and now he just company's worth half a billion dollars just I, from showing up every day i went back uh a couple of days ago and i looked for um i remember he tweeted at one point the like a picture of the first newspaper and i'd forgotten that the top half is you know barstool spores and it says uh for the common man by the common man so the mm-hmm. motto stayed the same for 15 years but the bottom half of the front page is a Hooters ad. <laughs> I was like, man, this guy was really gunning for the ads on day one. And I think they got Hooters back as a sponsor this year, too, <laughs> or 2019. So that, and then once I went down to, like, Dave rabbit hole, like, historical tweets, uh, I was like, what other ridiculous things? And I remembered he made the Bitcoin video. Yeah, yeah. So in 2017, there's a video of him, and he's like, I don't know what this shit is. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, whatever, like... I'm just all in though. <laughs> Some guy told me this is how I get rich. <laughs> Funny story. I literally set him up with a wallet right before he re- recorded that. So I walked out of the room, he shut the door and hit record on that video. And I like went downstairs and I was like, you should not be. Yeah. Like, he was like holding his treasure up at the camera. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so the only, the first time I discovered that some of the guys at Barstool were into Bitcoin was uh, Nate. Yeah. I think like Nate either like tweeted about it or or maybe we were like DM or I, I forget. But at some point, like he revealed himself as being interested. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, shit, like these dudes have a lot of influence. And if they position it as like gambling, this is going to get bad real fast because like they got an army of people who are going to do what they say to do. And it was just kind of like, oh, shit. I mean, that's why I was happy. I mean, not saying that I had any influence on any of these, yeah. any of the Barstool uh, employees, but I was happy to potentially be a voice of reason Put in the background breaks there. On. Like, all right, guys, uh, stuff's blown up and crashed many times in the past. Like, uh, it's uh, slow and steady is the game here. Probably, most likely, in my opinion, Bitcoin is the only one worth buying. It definitely is the only one worth buying, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, no. I mean, they lean into everything. Like we were talking about uh, zillion beers, they they know when to touch when something's hot and when to lean in, and that's something that Dave's really uh, honed in on. 
uh, is leaning in on stuff. Yeah. My favorite thing um, that I've learned from Barstool, you don't even remember saying this to me, but it's actually something you told me. When you came to record the first podcast episode, I think I asked you something like, as you're leaving, I was like, what'd you learn? And you're just like, show up every day. Yeah. And like, it's always stuck in my head from a, that's literally what that man did. He just for 14, 15 years, showed up every day. And if you, I think Erica uh, Nardini, the CEO, gave an interview and she was like, yeah, I got to the office and like, there's like uncashed checks laying everywhere. <laughs> like These guys had <laughs> no clue what they were doing. And if you go back and look at like the old rundowns, it's Dave standing in the quote unquote office, which really looks like his like parents' attic, basically. Rest in peace to the Milton office. <laughs> and uh, he's standing there and he's somehow videoing himself. And then you got Big Cat and KFC like sitting at their home, basically. And they're just talking shit to each other. But it's entertaining, it's funny, and that's how you build the audience is like people who want to watch that stuff come back every day, day after day for years, and then you get what they got today. Yeah, no, I mean, I was, I've been a stool, stoolie since high school, so I was- How I old are you? Uh, 28. Okay, you're younger. Yeah, so I was in college the first time oh. I, like, I was probably like a sophomore, 31. Yeah, they had, uh, they had Philly, I'm from Philly, and Philly, the Philly bar still outfit had a really good writer. He's not there anymore, Tall Maurice, uh, Mo. Uh, and I really liked his takes on Philly sports and, and the culture around Philly. Mo, that is a Philly name if yeah. I've ever heard one. <laughs> I think he's working at actually. Uh, he's in New York somewhere now. But um, yeah, I started reading in high school. And then when I was actually at DePaul in Chicago in college, Big Cat actually lived not too far from me. So I, I would see him walking Stella like, every once in a while. And it's funny, like, I've seen the brand grow. And now I'm just happy. Uh, that they are where they are now because I think they're a great example of show up, work hard, and it took a lot of hard work. Oh, for sure. Which uh, a lot of people take for granted these days. And like we were saying, a lot of media companies try to skirt that hard work with clickbait and other stuff like that. He also, uh, talking about like leaning in, um, he understands like the trends more than I think people give them credit for. Uh, my oh, favorite yeah. is the recent uh, hiring of Vin Dog. <laughs> <laughs> the meme lord, Vin. 63-year-old man who, <laughs> they literally just text me, goes, hey, we got a meme more brewing over here, are you ready? <laughs> and like, as much as it's uh, comical and entertaining, whatever, like that is the where the world is today, right? Yeah. If you overwhelm an opponent, you know, an intellectual opponent on the internet with memes, like you win internet points. And well, they understand that. Yeah, no, they definitely understand that. And it, uh, no, it highlights something we talk a lot about in Bitcoin, too, like the, under, the sovereign individual thesis. Like it is, we talked about it in that book, like it's going to be independent content creators that win the minds of the masses, especially as traditional media sort of gets too bloated and monolithic to, to move like a barstool does. Like mm-hmm. nobody could be as brash as barstool is because they, they have too much of a quote unquote reputation that they're worried about tarnishing. And Dave just takes it the complete opposite way. And it, it's worked out for them. I mean, yeah. in the modern age of digital media, barstool is obviously winning. Uh, What's your favorite segment that they do across the whole company? Uh, I'm a big fan of the wonton Don. Donnie oh. does. I, do, I think he actually does a very good job of uh, introducing uh, the Barstool audience to to other cultures. And he does a – it's not your average travel show, but it definitely is a, a unique way to get introduced to, to other cultures outside of America. Yeah. I did not think you were going to pick that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. I think that my favorite thing that's happened with a segment is now Dave's become a celebrity when he does the uh, uh, the pizza, pizza reviews. reviews. Like the fact that he walks out of a pizza store and all of a sudden there's like 20, 30 people all taking pictures of him. Like what, is, like what world do we live in? Yeah, I mean, I'll be sitting at my desk at home and I'll just hear my wife laughing in the background. Like, you watching the pizza review? She's like, yeah. <laughs> she loves it. Um, no, that's, some, that's another thing you lean into, right? Like, yeah. It just, uh, when they moved to New York... They did a few pizza reviews up in Boston, I think, like every once in a while. And then New York being the city of pizza, just lean into that. And it's become a, I've got a fucking app for it, a uh, standalone app. I'm, uh, they probably, well, actually, Dave probably wants this to be a forgotten segment, but uh, I'm going to remind everyone remember that Dave walks to work? Yeah. <laughs> and he would walk down the street and he was live streaming. And then all of a sudden, people started to like recognize where he was. 
And I remember the one day that uh, some guy, some stoolie, saw him walking down and videoed and got his, his bald, bald spot. spot. And it was like mass chaos for like three days. <laughs> and all of a sudden, Dave went, walks to work, went away. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never, yeah, that was an incredible one. I mean, that's the beauty. That's another thing. That's the beauty of, of Dave. It's like interactive with the fans. Yeah. And that's something I try to do with our podcast, like Sub Freaks. What, do you, what are you guys doing? Like, it, it's walk us through kind of everything. So you started with the newsletter. Started then you got the, the podcast. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So we have the newsletter, which is uh, a daily newsletter, uh, six days a week now. Um, and oh, because you added Saturday. Yeah. Sat, the Sat, Sat standard. standard. Trying to make Sats the standard. So we started the Sat standard. Um, God, guy's so smart. It's like man. a weekly. Uh, that's Branding a, genius. That's Matt O'Dell. Um, he named that. Um, but, yeah, we're, I mean, I then it all started organically. It's grown organically, which I'm very happy of i don't think we've forced too many things mm-hmm. up to this point and again so the newsletter started as family and friends reaching out mm-hmm. and uh again before i even like reached out to barstool or uh work there i had the mentality of i want to bring a barstool like voice to bitcoin because it's so hard to approach for a lot of people so i just try to make it more approachable for it with my family and friends in mind and then it's taken on a life of its own obviously a lot of people are reading it now and then the podcast was the next iteration of that. And that's people are like, all right, I like your writing. Let's, let's do a podcast. W- what's the process for coming up with what to write every morning? <laughs> I, I write every morning and I, I'm assuming we have the you same know, process, but I want to hear yours first. I just wake up and see what I tweeted the day before and <laughs> point at something I'm like, all right, spend an hour writing on this. So some days I have a better, uh, idea than others, but yeah, at some point you got to write and you just got to pick something around with it. I think we're very similar in the like I gotta write something, so like let me quickly search for inspiration, whether it's something I tweeted, something somebody else tweeted, or like an article, and then just what do I think about this? I don't know. Uh, yeah. And next thing you know, you hit publish and like you're done. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I try to give, I attempt to bring uh, a good perspective on everything every day and be as factual and educational as possible. Like I was, I was happy with today's bent because it was more technically focused and something. You do do that more than most, I think, is that you, whenever there's updates, or I remember when, like, was it the inflation bug, and, like, you're able to not only explain the technical aspects of it, but also then pull in all these different, like, I probably have discovered more people in the Bitcoin, like, hardcore technical community through you than anybody else. Yeah, no, that's... I don't know where you find them, but you're always like, oh, my friend, uh," it's like some, like, (laughs) random person, like, what the fuck? It's been it's just being on Twitter for so long. I've been curating a Bitcoin list since like 2015, I think. And that's like is it public or private? It's public. Uh, it's got like five five hundred followers now, which is pretty that's cool for a bad. list. But um, yeah, I, I I feel like I've put my ten thousand hours in and, mm-hmm. and know who to follow and where the good information comes in. Like again, going back to the sovereign individual, you have to create and filter your own news sources and find the signal yourself. It's not going to be brought to you. You got to really work hard for it. And over the last six, seven years, I've really been sort of filtering my information feeds and, uh, being here in New York, we're blessed to be able to go to meetups like bit devs where you have some of the core developers showing up and explaining what they're working on. Um, so that certainly helps. And, yeah, I just feel like, again, I put a lot of time trying to understand how this all works and uh, feel like I'm in a unique spot to sort of uh, translate that for some people in a, in a, in a way which is more digestible than uh, technical documents or something like that. At the end of every newsletter, you put your, like, what, what do you call it, random thought? Final thought. Final thought. Um, where, where do they come from? Because some of them are hysterical. You, it, the one I think I told you this before. You hit us one time with like a I like sitting in the shower. A, no, I was hungover, and there's no, no worse feeling than being hungover, sitting in the shower. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's literally a final thought. I think I had taken a shower before I wrote the bent that morning. It was like, and so you just there. whatever you whatever yeah. thought you had, just randomly. Yeah, like this morning, it was like a big big shave day for me. I was like, I went and shit, like trimmed my beard up, and that was it. Because at some point you got to get it out, and I don't. I'm in a final thought been a lot of music lately like a song i'm listening mm-hmm. to while i'm writing i'll just link to that youtube um say i like this i like this song all right and then the podcast you do one to two interviews a week plus you've got the rabbit hole recap mm-hmm. what let's talk about the interviews first and then 
Matt O'Dell was like the MVP surprise out of nowhere one day. Just like, oh, Matt O'Dell now is going to do this every single week. I was like, these guys are fucking incredible. <laughs> so where, what was the point of starting the podcast initially? Uh, people wanted more than the newsletter. And they wanted to hear uh, from the people I was writing about directly. And again, being in New York, that everybody comes through New York yeah. at some point or another. And there's a lot of Bitcoiners here in New York. So it was just easy. Um, having been gone to bit devs and uh, meeting these developers and people working in the space, it was pretty easy. Once you develop a, le- a level of trust, just to be like, hey, you want to come on and discuss this stuff on air? Um, and so, yeah, that was the impetus for that. And it's been incredible. I've forged some great friendships, learned a lot uh, doing that alone. And then Matt and I started Rabbit Hole Recap in September of, tw- or, yeah, September of 2018. Did you know that you wanted to start like another type of show or did you guys just do one and then you're like, oh, let's do it again? No, we, I tapped Matt on the shoulder intentionally being like, we need a, a weekly show. Got it. I really love your shit. Um, Matt had been on the podcast earlier that year. Uh, he's here in New York. Yep. Um, and yeah, I never, I don't ever just want to put content out to put content out. Like I want to make sure it's has value. And so like I, I got to a point where I thought like I was forcing interviews Mm-hmm. And something like a weekly news show is something with Matt was something dependable where you could keep putting content out mm-hmm. and it's not forced. It's uh, it's actually got a legit um, strategy and mm-hmm. and sort of uh, like what's the word I'm looking for cadence and uh, structure, if you yeah. will. Makes sense. Um, how do you think about like freedom of speech? in today's world now that we've seen the great purge of zero hedge on twitter <laughs> <laughs> i think freedom of speech is uh is i know you have a lot so for those that don't know uh i've seen i think you go on two tirades on twitter over the last like maybe 12 months or so that i can remember and one of them was all around the zero hedge situation so just like it happened zero hedge got banned there's a whole bunch of controversy around who led to that banning, who participated, why they got banned, was it doxing, was it not, all this stuff. It's been a couple of weeks now. Like, what's your thoughts now? Yeah, I mean, I Are don't you think... more fired up or less fired up? I mean, that's a that's the thing. Like, as time passes, there's, it feels like you're powerless. There's nothing you can do. Like, I'm definitely... Oh, like it kind of feels like it's over. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I'm obviously not as fired up as... Well, it was. I think it was exactly three weeks ago at this point as it was this time three weeks ago. But I still think it's fucked up that Zero Hedge was banned. Like, I don't think they should have been. And Zero Hedge, for me personally, like, after 2008, 2009 crisis, like, they were actually a very good source of quality information. And, yes, they've strayed away from that a bit with a lot of uh, shittier pieces on their site. But there still is very good content on their site. You just have to, again, you have to know how to filter it. And I think their banning is an example of free speech being attacked in the modern age. Again, going back to the onus is on the individual to filter information, in my opinion, these days. And to have uh, Silicon Valley tech companies sort of dictating uh, who they believe uh, should be able to speak and not speak on their platforms, that just, it just doesn't uh, sit well with me. So, like, I don't disagree with anything you just said. I always then jump to like, what is the answer? Right? Like, if I was Mark Zuckerberg, Jack Dorsey, etc., I always struggle with. I don't know if there is an answer. Herbit man, <laughs> <laughs> Bitcoin sign guy over here. Herbit, something like Herbit, maybe. I mean, owning your own data, right? Like, uh, I think that may be the answer. Or what I say, been saying more recently, is people just need to speak up. Like a lot of it shouldn't take people with tens of thousands of followers on Twitter to speak up on behalf of other people like individuals. The silent, I believe there is a silent majority out there who mm-hmm. does feel the same way that freedom of speech is being attacked and feel like they're powerless. I feel like more people need to speak up mm-hmm. and demand that uh, free speech be protected. And then you can roll that into privacy as well. You know, our privacy is being eroded as at the same time as free speech is. I mean, hand in hand, especially with financial privacy, like money is dictated as free speech here in the United States. 
And all right, that makes me think. I, were, I think you were the one today who said, uh, "Oh no, you said delete Coinbase about the Clearview <laughs> stuff." I thought you said "fuck Clearview," but no, you said delete Coinbase. Um, when you think of privacy, how do you balance? Like, there's information, photos, etc., that's been put into the quote unquote public sphere that some of it was done intentionally, right? You or I posted photos of ourselves five years ago on the internet, and they're still out there somewhere. Some of it's unintentional. I have a photo with you from five years ago, and I post it. You don't even know that I posted it, right? And somebody can come find it, et cetera. That type of information being used for fish recognition and things like that. Like, how, how do you think through the framework? It's inevitable, right? I mean, but... I would agree with that. It's inevitable, but, like, we should have, again, constitutional protections in p- place where can't be used against you as aggressively as it is like mm-hmm. i think we have two paths we can go down right now we either get back towards uh, the arc of freedom freedom of speech privacy freedom to move money or we export the chinese surveillance social credit system to the rest of the world and that's what i say in the newsletter a lot we are erecting the digital panopticon and being cattle herded into it while right now it's just credit scores and uh, Instagram feeding you ads based off of what you talk about with your wife. Um, but in a second, they could flip the switch and just be used against you. And uh, one second, uh, you're getting fed ads. The next, you're not being allowed to buy plane tickets because you said something uncouth. Yeah. Or you went outside yeah. to another country and there's a virus. And, <laughs> now you, and now you can't fly back to the United States. Yeah. Right. Um, which l- literally I went to my cousin's wedding in Mexico and I think United Airlines literally emailed me four times before the flight being like, if you went to China in the last 14 days, don't show it to the airport. And I was like, well, thank God I didn't. But if I had, how do you get home? Yeah. And how do you, yeah. Right. And that, and that's for like a quote unquote health related incident. You were basically saying, well, what if it was just cause you posted a stupid picture, right? Or you are friends with somebody slippery slope and that's why i mentioned urbit right you want to build systems and bitcoin falls into the scattered quarry too systems where it's just not possible to do stuff like that like Mm -hmm. bitcoin being a distributed peer-to-peer cash system where if you are running your own full node and you have control of your utxos and uh, you are broadcasting the transactions yourself it's very hard for people to stop you from doing that do we get to a world where everyone does that I hope so. I think that's an ideal we should strive for. I can't say that with any degree of certainty. You think that's a world we should go towards? Definitely. We should strive for it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, again, if not, um, we're getting getting the social credit score system exported here, and we're going to be subjected to that as well. Yeah. It's like minority report. The part to me that is really interesting as you think through kind of how all this is happening is you have two competing forces. Um, You've got probably people who like you and I who are more in the camp of uh, we should protect freedoms and like not go down that rabbit hole. And then you've got people who um, make an argument that the world would be better if we go into that. Right. So like when it comes to the privacy stuff, it's like, Oh, we could uh, stop crime if uh, we have everyone's, you know, GPS on their phone and we know where they are. Like, well, yeah, uh, okay, maybe, but like, we just took everyone else's freedom, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like, do you look to protect people or do you look to actually protect the freedoms of people? I mean, I think we should do the latter, and I think the former is being proven to be completely wrong. Like, you are harming more people than helping more people with KYC AML regulation, like. Explain that. Every time you have to give up your personal information, like a lot of the Bitcoin exchanges, including the one that sponsors my podcast, you... Which one is it? Go ahead, give them a shout out. Use the code stacking sats when you download the cash app. You're going to get $10 and $10 is going to go to Owls Lacrosse. Um, Do you see the hard work it takes to clearly (laughs) articulate the advertising off the dome? He didn't even have to read it. (laughs) Uh, Shout out to cash app. But... When you do KYC AML, you have to give up your, a lot of times your driver's license, passport, home address, where you work, how mm-hmm. you're receiving funds, and you give it to these companies and they hold it in databases that have proven to be completely insecure. Like we had the Equifax hacks, mm-hmm. uh, Target hacks, hacks 
any hack you can think of. The, the, well, those the, are the ones we know about. Well, the Department right. of Defense just got hacked like last right. year. They came out and announced that last week. Like the people who are forcing these regulations on us can't even can't even protect their own system. So I think a facial recognition wasn't there. Somebody uh, that at like Customs and Border Patrol or like a, a contractor or something they got hacked and had a bunch of images of everyone's like faces. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that or and I believe they had like the X-rays that could like see through, um, crazy see through clothes like that got hacked as well at some point. Yeah. I think so. I'm not certain on that, but the point remains, a lot of these companies and uh, government agencies that are forcing KYC on people are getting hacked, and then you have people's date of birth, social security number, home address, which freaks me the fuck out, pictures. Of their driver's license passport on the dark web is being sold to the to for it's not even bidding war they just get sold at a certain price mm -hmm. and your information's out there and you're vulnerable and then what they are proclaiming to protect us from anti-money laundering laws the banks that are supposed to uh, basically enforce these laws become the biggest perpetrators of the of money laundering like hsbc had bank teller windows purposely fitted for Mexican drug lords suitcases, briefcases. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. And That's that, wild. Yeah. And, and Wells Fargo as well. They, Wells Fargo was, uh, this is my big knock on uh, on Warren Buffett. It's like, hey, man, you know, uh, what do you say? Long suit or short suitcases? Like, dude, Wells Fargo is one of your biggest, you know, uh, holdings or one of the holdings in your portfolio. And they, they pleaded guilty. They didn't even fight it. They pled guilty to helping the Sonoa cartel launder millions of dollars. like Billions of dollars. With well, HSBC, it was billions of dollars, and they got slapped with a couple hundred million dollar fine, so it's just the cost of doing business at that point. So you're not really protecting anybody. Getting the and bank teller window to be refitted for suitcases is an all-time yeah. stat. And, that's like, and then they tell you that you, you need to do this stuff for your protection and and. The, and them behind your back they're just like completely ignoring the laws and then not getting in trouble for it when they get caught and they're mm -hmm. just ha get slapped with a fine it's the cost of doing business where you fucking get caught selling a dime bag on the corner in harlem and you're going to the fucking rikers for years it's fucked up yeah i i uh one of the things that i think will definitely change over the next I don't know, five years or so is it's not only going to see the decriminalization of all like the possession of small drugs and you know all that kind of stuff. It's going to actually become uh, like the social pressures on anyone who feels differently. I can't believe that you think we should put humans in a cage because of it. Oh yeah, that's a good point to bring up. Like the whole basis for anti money laundering specifically is the drug war is like the number one mm -hmm. uh, justification and the drug war is an abject failure it's been going on for decades and people have not stopped doing drugs people have not stopped selling drugs uh, they've actually made more money doing it now they make more money doing it now and then you push people towards you so weeds a schedule one narcotic like you can't use that for medicinal purposes it's becoming more commonplace now but for the longest time you couldn't and uh regulated opiates were pushed on the masses did and we have an opiate crisis in the did country did you watch uh, the netflix uh, documentary the pharmacist yeah incredible right like when they showed the video so for those that don't know uh netflix got a, a new documentary out called the pharmacist and it's a gentleman his son dies um buying drugs he gets murdered uh and he goes basically on like a one man it, it was kind of like a taken ver you know except for it was like an old white guy <laughs> yeah but it was it's a great it's like i'm gonna fucking figure this out yeah he did hard hard detective work which which the powers that be don't want to do anymore they just want to throw all these regulations on people and uh just throw people in cages in a lazy fashion the pharmacist i forget his name but he did hard detective work and eventually found his child's killer brought him to justice and then like the rest of the documentary is he was a pharmacist and it uh, opened his eyes it opened his eyes and he he noticed a bunch of people coming in buying opiates from dr cleggett yeah from dr <laughs> cleggett and he's watched the opiate crisis destroy his community and the video that shocked me was when 
he, so when you say hard detective work, he's literally like in his car, 2 a.m., like videoing through the windshield with the lights off type shit. Yeah, calling people, going through the phone book and calling everybody within like a 10 block radius of where his son was murdered. Yeah. And that's but but he, he shows a video where it's, I don't know, 10 o'clock, midnight, 2 a.m., whatever. It's late at mm-hmm. night and the doctor's office is open and that's when she's actually giving out all of these prescriptions. And all of a sudden he goes, and then I couldn't believe it there was a New Orleans police officer at the door, and he wasn't there to bust them. He was there to run security. Yeah. It's, like, what? <laughs> it's, I mean, that's a shining example of the two-tiered system we're subjected to. And that's why, again, that's why I think more people need to speak up. Like, it's fucked up. Like, and people just put up with it. And that's why I decide to dedicate my life to writing and talking about Bitcoin, because I think it is an imperative technology moving forward, because it allows us to sort of wrest control uh, of our sovereignty, financial sovereignty particularly, away from these people who do not care about you and do not follow the laws that they want you to follow. So the, the event that recently happened that uh, really opened my eyes to just like no one is safe um, is the Jeff Bezos dick pic uh, <laughs> situation, <laughs> right? right? Like the richest dude in the world got hacked and Wait, how, how about how about them trying to blame it on the Saudis too, and it wound up being his side piece just sending it to her brother. Yeah, but like here, but here's my whole point: is like I don't know what's true. That's true, right? Like maybe he got hacked, and the girlfriend's brother sold it for money. Like who knows? Yeah. But just the fact that the richest man in the world is even possible Why are you to have his dick pics, phone? Jeff. Well, that's a whole other thing. I mean, come on. You got billions of dollars. Let that let that flex for you. <laughs> Stop sending dick pics if you're doing it out there. I'm happy to say I've never sent one in my life. I'm with you. It's probably because my wiener's not worth sending dick pics. <laughs> 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 no, but it's just this idea of, like, the richest man in the world is not safe from the same things you and I aren't safe from. Yeah. Right? And, like, in some triumphant way, we're smarter because we don't send dick pics. Right? <laughs> but, like... Like, dude, what? Everyone in the world that is an adversary of you is gunning for some sort of dirt, some sort of angle on you, whatever. And it could simply be if somebody sent you a video and you open it and bam, your phone's compromised. Yeah, it's the information age. We all have access to the same powerful technology, encrypt, encryption-based technology. Like, it levels the playing field for this stuff. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how powerful you are. Uh, the internet has its ways to, to find it out. There's a bunch of people out there who are getting good at the internet and can bring you down pretty easily. The So that, that's like a very targeted, I want to get Jeff Bezos, but um, the thing that scares the shit out of me, so do you have a Alexa or Google no, Home? No, yeah, not so, allowed. Yeah, not so, allowed in our home. Same. So like we don't have any of this stuff, right? But uh, I saw a clip of, um, it was kind of like multiple versions where people have infiltrated uh, the ring internal cameras Mm -hmm. and they it's an audio and video so they can see into your home where you set up the camera and then they start speaking to like a dude on his couch eating popcorn or a little kid or whatever and they're like hey man we watching and the like what the fuck right and they're like hey you hear me over there and you're like dude you literally put a camera for somebody to hack into in your home and gave them a microphone to scare the shit out of them. Yeah, you run it on Wi-Fi. They can do that. And then if you have, like, Nest, they can literally fuck with the, the temperature of your house. Oh, man. Like, the internet... At some is, point, they'll be able to unlock your doors because it'll oh, all be Bluetooth, Amazon's whatever. trying to get that to people with Ring. They're trying to make it so you can, like, have... Oh, really? When you're not home, Amazon can open your door and leave your package inside so they don't get stolen. But people are like, oh, that's convenient. Again, and that's the weird predicament we find ourselves in in the information age a lot of people uh seeding uh freedoms and uh privacy for convenience and that's mm-hmm. i mean we're we are still monkeys at the end of the day we're still animals and we have animalistic tendencies and we have reptile brains that uh, just over millions and millions of years of evolution still react in certain ways and will take convenience over uh privacy and uh, safety just because it's easier, right? Um, so that's one thing we do need to focus on in this day and age is you really have to think about what you're seeding when you when you bring these technologies into your home. Like I I have the, the little shield for my camera on my laptops, mm-hmm. 
but like yeah but my laptops can hear me i don't have alexa or google home but i'm sure apple's it, uh, or somebody who's hacked i'm pr- i just assume that everything you own has been hacked yeah, yeah, um, yeah i'm sure somebody's able to listen in some microphone in some capacity in my own. i mean look it, it's exhausting if you took a really hardcore privacy first mindset you would switch out devices. You would, you know, not bring certain device. Like, you wouldn't have a cell phone, right? I mean, like all this stuff, and it just life would suck, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? So it's like there's definitely a balance. Uh, but like, so I, I draw the line at the smart speakers for sure. So no Alexa, Google Homes, any of that. Anything else that you won't bring into your home? Um, ring cameras, no obviously. Ring. Right? Yeah, no ring. I like. I live in an apartment building. My neighbor has ring on his door. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, we, have, we have cameras <laughs> well, in here already. Because Amazon needs to drop a package <laughs> off. <laughs> That's what the front door is for. Like uh, the doorman. Um, what else? That's that's off the top of my head. That's all I can think of. Yeah. Like uh, yeah. I, I, I try to be as low tech as possible. Only the bare necessities. It, it it's also a thing where um, it's not only the decisions you make though. In your Uh, home, you get to make the decisions. But when you walk outside, like, I forget, I think there was a study, maybe it was in London, a person who walked to work, the average walk to work, how many times a camera recorded them? And it was like 140 times, you know, some stupid number where you're just like, how's that even possible? There's dating app, Hinge is a dating app where it's like literally tracks you as you walk to work and tries to partner you with people who have a similar uh, commute that you do. Really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not on it. That's, apparently, that's what the kids are using. One of the <laughs> one of the things the kids are, are using. Are you on TikTok? They, God, no. That's a cursed app. I would Why? Never, I, China? I think China's taking all that data, and then it's making people do weird things. So. Like what? Like, you think China's, like, secretly programming dance moves in America? No, I just, I just, yeah, I just don't think it incentivized towards anything productive. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. I, I, the part that I think is crazy uh, when it comes to all this stuff is we live in a world where if you went and you asked like 15 year old kids would you rather be a professional athlete or like a TikTok star it's like a growing percent of them they'll say they want to be TikTok star yeah right and <sighs> so they're like getting habitually addicted to this like feedback loop that's a screen and it kind of reminds me of the like ready player one type Mm -hmm. you know like there's the the one world and you go into the portal of a different world like we're basically there already yeah i mean i experienced this shit on twitter i'd be lying to you if i didn't get dopamine hits from like some retweets and shit like that um and i try to limit it to that and and it's a double-edged sword because i use twitter as a networking uh, networking platform, Linked, uh, the the better LinkedIn. Better, I deleted yeah. LinkedIn. LinkedIn's worthless in my mind. Um, if you want, you can answer some of the LinkedIn messages I get from the uh, we're software developers. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if I couldn't take any more of the cheesy LinkedIn posts. I, one day, I just rage quit. I was like, this is not worth my time. You, uh, I don't think I ever told you this, but you'll love this. Uh, my dad is a LinkedIn savage. <laughs> so he used to have Facebook. My mom was like, yeah, knock that shit off. You spend way too much time on it. Then uh, he had Twitter for a little while and like quickly went down to like, I'm an old white Republican, you know, just saying all kinds of crazy shit. So like my brothers and I basically had the intervention like, hey man, chill out. Uh, and so he's on LinkedIn because, you know, he th- th- pretty much no one's going to make the argument that he can't do business there, right? So... My friends, the new uh, scheme is they will literally screenshot the his post. He comments, boss, and he rips people apart, boss. Like those posts you're talking about, where the like guys like ah, you know, this year we grew our revenue ten percent and we hired twenty people and like and they're like super self congratulatory. The one I remember is I had like sixteen friends all screenshot sent it to me. He like commented on some dude. He's like, you know, hey Sam. I see you are really good at learning how to self-congratulate yourself, but I never seem to see any of your businesses stick around for more than 12 months. Maybe Boss. you should like stop focusing on yourself <laughs> and actually focus on building a business. Like, you know, the rest of us are tired of reading your bullshit or whatever. And I was just like, he's not wrong. Mr. Pompliano, the LinkedIn troll, I love him. Yeah, but like, <laughs> you can't post that in 2020. No, we need more of him. It was like 2018. I'm going to come to the defense of your dad. We need more of him. We Especially on LinkedIn. Do. We probably do. And I was having this conversation earlier today. People are becoming more and more afraid to speak their minds, which is bad. Again, going back to free speech, people are self-censoring, which 
uh, is not good, I don't think. Well, here, here, here's my challenge to him. I said, look, two things. One, why the fuck are you friends with all my friends on LinkedIn? <laughs> and then I realized that somebody discovered him commenting and they told everyone else and everyone oh, started like, requesting him. Yeah, of yeah. course. Which, like, you know, shout out to my friends. They're geniuses for that. Uh, and then two... I was like, dude, what do you get out of that? And he was like, no, nah, that guy just need to learn his lesson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, hey, you got a point, but like. Right? I in person trolled somebody over the weekend, a group of a group of dudes. We were uh, in Brooklyn. My wife and I were What's walking. going on over there in that country in Brooklyn? Oh, my God. <laughs> All right, group of dudes. Too much cloud chasing. It's a, it's a cloud chasing nightmare over there. So there was a group of dudes cloud chasing, like taking pictures in front of a mural. And I'm like, what? And like, you could tell they were just like, about to post the Instagram, and I saw them from two blocks away. I'm like walking with my wife, stroller, a stroller. Oh yes. And uh, they uh, they walk by me, and they're like looking at their pics. So you tell like, which one should we post? I was like, ah, oh, did you get a good one? And they're like, you could tell they're like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> the dude with the stroller just trolled <laughs> us. <laughs> but it's like, to be honest though, once you get to like young dad status, I mean, no one can touch you. Yeah, I like mean, what are they gonna do? Turn around, and, like talk shit to you in front of your wife and your kid? No, I I was hoping so. I was hoping they would have the balls to, but that's the thing. Like everybody has this online persona, myself included. I'm guilty of it too, especially on Twitter. But um, but isn't Twitter like the WWF? Yeah, I mean Twitter. I think Twitter is merit, more of a meritocracy. I believe they were trying to post to Instagram, where it's uh, more of an art show. Yeah, more of like make your life look better than it actually is. Have you seen the uh, Instagram account that gets influencers in the wild? I've seen um, I've seen uh, people have I've seen people share it on Twitter where yeah. I've seen it yeah and like it's just me, a bunch of dudes taking pictures of their girlfriends on on the yeah. beach. I, I was uh, when I was at my cousin's wedding. Um, we were sitting on the beach uh, the day before, and I kid you, plenty like hits me and is like and I'm like what? And she hits me like two more times and she's like points, and there's one girl standing I don't know ten feet from the water, another girl standing with her feet like barely in the water and uh they're taking a picture of, of the girl near the water she's posing 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 it goes on for like eight nine ten minutes and you're like you gotta have a good like did you get a good one right like exactly <laughs> like you're a troll right <laughs> but i'd never seen this before they both come together they're looking like hey which one should we post exactly what you just described they go sit down five minutes later playing like punches me I'm like what they're back oh my God. <laughs> same girl taking pictures of the same girl do the whole, you know, straight again. Go sit down. 20 minutes later, they're back a third time. I literally almost got up and was like, hey, y'all got to chill. Like, <laughs> what are you doing with your life? <laughs> well, just, just you spent the last hour, I, I already know, trying to get one photo. Yeah. And by the way, I don't think that the photo is going to change anything about what's <laughs> going on. You're already in Mexico. People know, I promise. <laughs> is a dopamine hit worth it? But a great test is, uh, is your wife on Twitter? Uh, she's not. She's not. All right. So Polina's on Twitter. And one day I was driving. Polina actually, uh, when I first met her, she had more followers than I did. Like I had like 1,500. She had like 4,000, right? And she still gives me shit about it today. And so she's still got like a big, I don't know, she's got like 20-something thousand, almost 30,000 followers. So it's not like her Twitter is ghost town, right? She's got stuff, whatever. But I handed her uh, my phone one day, and I'd said something like controversial, and I was people all freaking out. So again, going back to like, I'm addicted to the dopamine just like everybody else. I was like, what are they saying? And she refreshed the notifications, and notifications popped up. Refreshed it again, popped it again. She looks at me because goes, this is fun. Yeah. <laughs> and she was just like, every time you just refresh, like, there's something there. And it hit me. I was like, holy shit, we're just rats and hamsters on the wheel, man. Yeah, I mean, and it feels, uh, it feels like we're but it feels like we're coming more cognizant of this too. Like, but does it matter? It's unhealthy. Do you change your behavior? I uh, now that I have a child, I try to. Okay. Um, there's because it, it makes you it really puts in front of you that there's more important things in life. <laughs> um, but do I want to go yell at the the, the <laughs> trolls or do I want to go hang out with my kid? Yeah, I want to go actually live life. Um, and I'm still, I still have my moments where I'm on Twitter way too much. Like my wife would definitely say that I'm on Twitter way too much still. Um, it is an addiction and it's actually, there's studies coming out. Um, that's affecting the young people terribly. Like it's creating terrible social hierarchies, particularly in middle school, particularly affecting uh, the girls too. Like you have self-harm and suicide rates 
for like 12 to 17 year olds spiking because of the uh, sort of hierarchy that social media is causing for them. I, I was um, with a guy who's an eighth grade teacher, but I think he teach or I think he's a science teacher maybe, but I couldn't resist asking like, what's going on in middle school, right? Just like you're in it every day, man. You're doing hand to hand combat with, you know, 13 year olds. Like, what are they doing? And he told me that the biggest things uh, are one, they all know everything before the teachers, right? Because they're always on their phones. Two is uh, the things that they are consuming are like complete shit. It's all TikTok and like all this kind of stuff. And he goes, the third thing is we don't know that the bullying's happening. Yeah. And he goes, all the bullying that like you and I probably saw when we were in school where it was like physical, you know, bullying or like people would point and make fun, not sit with them at lunch, like all that shit. I'm sure some of it still goes on, but he's like the bad shit all happens online and the teachers are completely removed from it. So what they actually have is like basically like rats. They like develop sources and like, you know, little Johnny tells the teacher like, hey man, like everybody's being really mean to Mary. Yeah. And the teacher's got to like try to, I'm like, dude, we want you to teach, <laughs> right? Like, but this is what you're spending your time on. He's like, yeah, we have to because the kids are freaking out about it. Yeah. And it's like, I, I talk about this a lot on the podcast too. Like we're just born at this inflection point and we don't know how this stuff's going to affect, again, being animals and monkeys that have an evolutionary process. Like this change is so drastic and so quick. We literally don't know how it's affecting or beginning to find out how it's affecting our psyche and our social interactions. But it's playing with fire, right? Because the change is so drastic. The information spread is so instantaneous. And we're literally chemically trying to react to this change in real time. And it's f very hard, if not impossible, because the pace of change we're living through right now is s far greater than any pace of change we've ever lived through up to this point in history. Speaking of pace of change, uh the macro economy <laughs> is on stilts. It is wobbling. <laughs> and it feels like it's just waiting for someone to kick one of the legs out and this whole thing's going to topple over. It feels like coronavirus might be that, that kick. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, it would make sense that there's something that causes economic slowdown in activity. And next thing you know, like you pop the pin. Yeah. Right. Or I guess the pin pops the bubble. Right. Yeah. And what do you, th you think is going on? Like I'm literally staring at Twitter right now, and hashtag stock market crash 2020 is the third <laughs> top <laughs> trending topic right now. Well, it's a um, after number four, hashtag Trump crash. <laughs> so like, well, it's the way we structure our, our economy. Like again, going back to time preference, we live in a very, uh, I believe Pierre Rochard uh, coined the term the high velocity trash economy. Um, <laughs> We, uh, the incentives of our economy are such that like we're forced uh, to go after growth at all costs. And I think that's basically the main crux of the issue that we're experiencing right now. I wrote about this earlier in this week in The Bent. There's a thought experiment, not a thought experiment, like a question posed by uh, an economist. I forget his last name, Tomas something. Um, he says you, when you're thinking about economic growth and economies and how you want your economy to run, you got to ask yourself the question, do you want to be a man on the bike or a man standing on his own two feet? And when you're a man on a bike, you have to keep going forward. If you stop momentum, you're going to tip over and fall over and hurt yourself. Whereas if you're a man walking on your own two feet, you have the opportunity to stop, recalibrate, look around without falling over and hurting yourself. And the growth at all cost economy that we live in right now we live in an economy on the bike uh, it's a debt fueled we went off uh, the gold standard in the 70s and since then we've been printing a bunch of money and uh, moving production or trying to stoke production in in the present uh, by taking money from the future and promising growth in the future more importantly and we're getting to the point particularly with the way demographics are set up in a lot of these countries in America specifically that it, it just doesn't make sense that we're going to be able to, to keep growing at the same pace. So macro trends right now, demographics are, are one of the biggest. It, it's the one thing that I didn't understand three or four years ago that now it's like, whoa, stop, you know, stop the alarm, the whole nine yards is demographics lead, 
right? And if you watch the demographics, you can pretty much understand what's going to play out. Um, Japan's a great example mm-hmm. of you know how this happened uh, a number of years ago, and the U.S. is probably better because well at least there used to be such a high desire for immigration so you kind of continue growth not just by your own birth rates but also kind of importing uh people from other countries but when you start to look at that there's this weird world of like you or i can't stop kind of the train right and like it's headed where it's headed we can analyze it we can talk about it we can warn people all this stuff but like that train's going what we do have control over though is what we do right and i think this low time preference when you start to like not only do low time preference but also the anti-consumerism your life like drastically changed like you really change the decisions you make on a daily basis what you buy you know all this kind of stuff and it's very free yeah you're just like i don't need all this shit that and then it's an important step towards fixing the problem so we need to invert the way things work right now everything across sectors across uh, uh, across life is very top down. Like the government, uh, obviously, the federal government here in the United States uh, makes a lot of decisions for everybody in the United States. I think that needs to change drastically, and it starts individually by maybe turning away from a consumerist lifestyle, trying to save more, get your own balance sheet in order. But I think we do really need to get back towards localism because what you have, Fed is a perfect example of this. Is people who think they know better than everybody else trying to uh, micromanage complex systems and that's impossible like I think one of the biggest causes of uh, sort of the the troubles we find ourselves in today is people fundamentally misunderstand complex systems or aren't even aware that they exist and we live in them Mm -hmm. Um, so the Fed trying to manipulate uh, the economy of 320 million people with interest rates of expansion and contraction of the monetary base in my opinion, is very top-down, and you have 12 people trying to micromanage a complex system, and that's just not possible. This stuff has to be emergent, and emerges from the bottom up, from you making personal decisions to save more instead of spend more, and then you move that up to the local level, or your township, your your town, and you guys make decisions for what you need at that level. Uh, you stand on your own two feet. You're not on a bike. You don't have to go growth at all costs at the at the city level. Uh, you can decide as a small community what you what is best for you at that given point in time. Um, where right now it's the complete opposite, and, and it's kind of like the false um, promise of like, oh well, of course we're going to listen to the the government, right? <laughs> like, the, how could they not have our best interest in heart? How are they not smarter than us? And then once you understand, no, they're just people. And, like, by the way, the people who are running those organizations usually have done nothing else other than optimize their life to get to that role. Yeah. And that's the scary part to me. Yeah. A lot of them never run businesses. A lot of them are psychopaths, sociopathic, uh, and just want power. Um, And, yeah, they really don't understand. They're completely uh, dislocated from the people they're representing. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. why Trump's president, right? Like, the... He, I, I actually think that his rise uh, to the presidency is going to go down as a like the most obvious thing in hindsight. You know, ten years from now, people look back and be like, "Of course that was going to happen." But we've almost forgot. Like, th- you know, when he first got elected, people are like, "What the fuck just happened?" Yeah, it was people, the little man, far away from the coastal elite, saying, "We need a change. I will do anything to get change." I'm not saying Trump being president is good. Yeah. I don't. I think he, he somehow convinced people he was the common man. Yeah, or that he was going to fight for the. Or at least going to fight for him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And whether or not he's followed through on those promises, a lot of people will debate. Um, I tend not to pay attention to the politics as much as possible because I do think, like, we're going to look back in retrospect, and this time, like, you never know that that the empire is crumbling in real time. You only look back in retrospect Mm -hmm. and are able to say, oh, it was obvious that the decline had set in and and we were in the middle of it. I think we may be in the midst of a a huge decline that in retrospect people look back and be like, holy shit. Like that. And and you're talking about not like a, a, in 2020, you're talking about like over a decade or something or maybe even longer than that. Yeah. I mean, not this single point in time, but yeah, I mean, you can go back. I mean, 2008 might be like the, what historians point out and be like, oh, that was 
Uh, that was the first crack in the armor. That was, yeah. I mean, that was basically when you can point to it and be like, all right, legitimacy of the system is gone. Mm-hmm. And How much of that? So, like, I, you and I are close in age, and t- I always describe 2008 as, like, the time where people around our age uh, were old enough to pay attention and kind of, like, realize something was happening, um, but not old enough to have enough assets to really, like, be hurt by it. Right. Mm -hmm. If you were 30 in 2008, you pretty much got like either wiped out or kind of, you know, you get knocked off your feet a little bit. If you're older than that, some people were well protected, some weren't. But if you're 16 to 22 years old, like you knew what was going on, especially if you were studying economics, you know, which we both did. um, But you didn't get hurt by it. And so you almost like grew up seeing what could happen, but didn't have the negative effect of it. And so you just don't trust the system. Yeah, no, I mean, I was 17 in the fall of 2008, again, taking a just happen chance, taking an elective economics class in high school. And uh, so we, I was fall quarter, I was in that class, and my teacher is very astute, like, gentlemen, this is not good. You should be paying attention <laughs> to this. We went through the TARP bill. And even then, like a 17 year old going through the TARP bill, like, the clauses that politicians snuck in just to get it passed as the country was in quote unquote dire straits. Like it, it just smelled of bullshit, reeked of bullshit. And so I definitely went into college with a no, your enemy mentality with all this stuff. And yeah, I'm, I mean, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't scarred by that, that happening at that particular point in time. And yeah, I don't trust it at all. Do, have you seen the, I think it's an HBO documentary panic and it's where they bring all, together all of the major players. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen, I've seen like, uh, and they do interviews with them? I've seen, uh, like, clips of it. I haven't watched the whole thing yet. Okay, so there's um, the most telling thing of anything I've ever watched, read, anything about the global financial crisis is in there. They've got, um, who's the Goldman guy, a uh, big, tall, bald guy? Paulson. Uh, Paulson, yeah. And uh, at one point, um, they're going through the story where he's about to go in front of uh, the government and ask for money. And he's like, I knew that we needed, you know, $700 billion. But I knew I couldn't ask him for that. So uh, what I do? Two uh, trill, baby. N- no, he, he's like, so what I do? Uh, I answered their questions, right? And uh, they then like basically show him the hearing. And they're like, so Mr. Paulson, like how much money are you going to need here? And he's like, well, you know, we don't know exactly. Blah, blah, blah. And he's like, basically bullshit. And they cut back to him. And he's just like cackling, laughing. And you're just like, don't tell me these people didn't know what they were doing. No, they, I mean. Like. He is telling you that he knew what he needed to do, went in front of Congress or, or Senate or whatever, answered questions, and did not say the answer. How do you ever trust that system again? You can't. And Where literally he gets to laugh about it 10 years later. Yeah, him, Geithner, all those guys. There's like a, there's a, there's like a meme. I think it's Timothy Geithner. I think he's at Davos or something. He's on stage. It's him and Paulson, and they're like cackling. It's not this interview, but they're cackling about like how they saved the world. Rudy Havenstein posts this every once in a while, and it's great. Account. It's uh, no, these people just they think they live on a different tier, and that they again, it's, they're power hungry. The incentives of the system, the way they're currently set up, allow those people to get to those points and control the system, and uh, they get they get a lot of uh, power from that, and that. Power corrupts, right? And they don't care about the little man. They didn't care about saving the country. Everybody got the little man got fucked. All well, their he, houses got possessed. He, here's the crazy part about the whole thing is I would actually make the argument the actions they took prevented further damage in that short period of time. But what I try to explain to people is it's like saying to your kid, hey, I'm going to teach you how to swim. And they start swimming. And you're walking next to them in the pool. And the second that they start to drown, you save them. And then they now think, because you continue to let them swim, that they know how to swim. And when you're not there later, they jump in the pool and they drown. Because literally you've like tricked them into thinking it's okay. Well, that's basically what's happening in the financial system in the sense of, hey, we'll do this quantitative easing thing. And like, we'll kind of like inflate away the problems. But at some point you gotta pay for the sins. Like that's what I like. Whether it's over leveraged, unprofitable companies in the public markets, whether it's central banking bullshit, like whatever, you eventually have to pay for your sins. And I think that's the scariest thing that we could face: is it all happening at once? Yeah. Well, now it's going to be worse. Why? Right? 
than if we just let it be. Oh, of course. The companies fail that should have failed in 2008 now. I mean, with the overnight repo operations, like the BIS came out and said there would have been multiple LTCM, long-term capital management, like blow-ups, if the Fed didn't step in and do overnight repo. like these, And it became apparent that the people in need of that repo liquidity were hedge funds doing leveraged trades. So the, the Fed is now stepping in and helping leveraged hedge funds maintain their margin positions. Like, it, it, they're... It was taboo to say 10 years ago, but they're propping up the markets quite literally. It's why the short squeezes like we saw with Tesla make me laugh. <laughs> right? Right. Because it's just like, look, you guys are all so fucking smart. And here's a dude who literally you guys just hammer on all day long. You call him a fraud, an idiot, whatever. And by the way, all of that may be true. But then you get short squeezed <laughs> and literally they're doing repo operations. Half of Wall Street's crying. And literally, he's like, dude, I just built a fucking cool car. And you like, watch this play out. And it's like, that's like a very salacious, everyone wants to talk about that one. But this happens quite often where you see all sorts of volatility. Like, I, I pulled up a chart uh, of the VIX. It's like literally skyrocketing so over the last couple of 20 weeks. right now? Uh, I haven't checked it the VIX in like quite that. a while. Well, well, I basically was just like, hey guys, uh, there are a lot of traditional investors who are like, ah, oh, Bitcoin's too volatile. I was like, anyone check out the VIX lately? <laughs> right? And over the last three days, it's just like fucking up and to the right. And so you look at it and you're like, every asset has its time. Uh, and the nice thing about the traditional market is there's lots of liquidity. And so usually the swings are, you know, gold's down three, three and a half percent today. And of course, you know, hey, Peter Schiff, dude, your, your rocks are becoming less valuable. <laughs> right? <laughs> now, granted, in the grand scheme of things, if you actually look at it rationally, it's three percent, it's nothing. Uh, th- that up or down in a Bitcoin day, nobody blinks. Yeah, It's just that the markets have gotten so conditioned for non-volatile days and kind of just this smooth up and to the right, but that's not how markets work if you don't manipulate them. Yeah, and it's, again, it's, it's a product of the short-term high-velocity trash economy we live in, right? Like, these intraday movements, p- people pay so much attention to when really the people should be taking a step back and looking and thinking about longer term. And again, it's like clickbait media has been brought to the financial world as well. People reacting to these quick movements and um, in stock prices. And again, like I think people need to lower their time preference and it's uh, it'll be interesting to see. Like we, again, it's consensus out there right now that the Fed is gonna step in and prop up markets. Like again, that was taboo not even a decade ago maybe three years ago that was taboo and now everybody is expecting it and me i said this on rabbit hole recap yesterday just heuristically the fact that everybody expects expects the fed to step in which they may try to step in um but uh, the fact that we 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 think it's going to happen like yeah. everyone is consensus thought is the problem yeah and and, and i'm just not convinced it's going to work this time but do you think that it's almost not even that we think it's going to happen, we want it to happen? Like, if everyone thinks it's <laughs> no, going to happen, people know, like, they need it to people happen. People need it to happen. Yeah. yeah. If people were ever over leveraged in the traditional system, uh, they definitely need it to happen. And, and again, like, it's cl- and my theory of why the Fed stepped in and sort of provided liquidity to these hedge funds, because probably a lot of pensions have monies in the hedge funds. And again, going back to demographics, you have all the boomers retiring right now. And as they're retiring, if you have the system implode, there's going to be chaos. Like, So here's my hot take when it comes to the pension. I knew, again, nothing about the pension world four years ago. I've gone and now met with a number of public pensions, corporate pensions, et cetera, and really started to unpack like, their challenges from like the investor seat, from the CIO seats. Impossible job because it's a combination of pressure of what we're investing in everyone's got some fucking scheme right it's like chamath going on cnbc and be like esg is a fraud yeah like look whether you agree with them or not like good for him for saying it and then the pensions become a uh, just bait for people looking for two and 20 okay so in the greatest bull market in history like i don't know 80 percent of pensions underperformed their benchmarks right <laughs> how the, well, fuck the benchmarks are what like seven percent a year yeah like how Cal- does that happen a- how do you fucking underperform 7% fees. a year? Fees. Even if there's fees, how do you fucking still underperform? The market was up 30%. You, you didn't beat 7 Yeah. It's because 
we live in a society where um, one of my partners, Mark, uh, always says, he goes, uh, numbers aren't going to be exactly correct, but directionally correct. For every one computer scientist that graduate here in the uh, South Korea graduates like 14. For every one lawyer they graduate, we graduate 40. And it's this whole idea of like they're a country of wealth creation. We're a country of wealth redistribution. And so if you're a pension investor, what are you doing? You're fucking scared shitless. You're going to get sued every time you make an investment. So what do you do? You just diversify as much as possible and you become super, super risk averse. But like that's not how you make money investing. Yeah. No. And part of that is what you're talking about, which is, oh, by the way, we're not going to do the work ourselves. We're going to hand the money to a bunch of managers because if they fuck up, we can fire them. Exactly. Right? And so you get into this weird, weird world, which, by the way, f the fee thing to me is hysterical because Mark told me a story um, that when he got to, I think it was UNC, uh, and I might fuck up the details a little bit, but when he got to UNC, everyone was like, we don't pay. Uh, like three and thirty or something, you know. All these hedge funds were coming out these crazy fee schedules. And he goes, guys, I don't care if I pay one and ten, two and twenty, three and thirty, or fucking ten and a hundred, you know, eighty percent. If the return we make is the is still better than all the other managers, the fee schedule doesn't matter, right? So like Jim Simons, they've charged like five and fifty. Holy shit! For like twenty five years. But his average annualized return over that span is 66%. N net of fees. Pretty bang up. So you're like, hey, dude, I'll pay you whatever you want if you give me 66%, right? right? And so it's just like, by the way, that's one guy who can't be replicated, right? I mean, he's he's far and away the best, whatever, at, at what he does. But when you start to look at this, the problem isn't, quote, unquote, fees. It's the manager who makes 10% a year and then charges fees and then turns around and hands the pension 3% annualized returns. You're like, dude, these people aren't going to get what they were promised. Yeah, and on top of that, you have the, the, the passive investing mindset, right, where you have all these funds sort of moving in lockstep in the same direction. And again, demographics come into play. Everybody goes to liquidate those passive funds that are in the same markets. Like, just the math is pretty straightforward. You're going to pull out all that value from, from those funds, and things are going to fall in price. Have you heard of, uh, I think it's Nevada or Utah, um, the uh, the state pension manager? Have you heard what he did? No. He went in. He gets hired. Fires, like, literally everyone. I think he kept, like, one person. Took all of the capital back and put it all in, like, low-cost passive indexes and was outperforming all of his peers. And everyone was like, what the fuck? And he was like, Basically, we're in a bull market. It's going to go up. You guys are all going to have to pay fees. Plus, your managers can't outperform, whatever. And this profile I was reading was, they are basically like, what the fuck do you do every day? <laughs> and they had a picture, and he's like sitting at his desk reading. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember being like, that dude's a boss. <laughs> it's like Michael Berry, just waiting. Yeah, like whether you think he's right or not, what, you know, yeah. whatever. It's just the fact that like, obvious has a very low time preference doesn't think he's got to be the smartest guy in the room and he just looks at kind of like a warren buffett like why are you guys paying all these hedge fund managers just buy indexes whatever and like maybe he's right maybe he's not but you got to respect somebody who has the intellectual uh courage to still have independent thought in today's day and age when everyone is rushing to passive funds etc or to the uh you know herd mentality all going two and 20 etc yeah yeah it's so again and it, it's it's a weird predicament we find ourselves in. Like, I think uh, the financialization of the world, to a certain extent, has created uh, a lot of passivity and decision-making from individuals, right? Like, financial literacy is something that should be uh, more of a priority for individuals. Um, taking care of your... I mean, Bitcoin is a huge driver of this for me personally. Like... You, I feel more confident in my personal decisions. I control my money and it's worked out up to this point because I feel like I'm better educated in that and making mm -hmm. more educated decisions as an individual instead of allocating that to somebody else who has maybe perverse incentives to, to push you into something with higher fees or uh, just go along with the crowd and yeah. maybe they get lazy at their job. Murad told me this uh, and Masir was the one really, his brother hammered it home for me, which was this idea of like, that teacher, that firefighter, that mid-level manager, whoever, we as a society want them to be great at their job. And then we also require them through financial incentives to be professional investors as well. Yes. And 
that's really hard one and two uh is a non-realistic expectation we have so something like a bitcoin where it's disinflationary monetary schedule deflationary supply demand economics provide you know are applied etc if all of a sudden you can have an asset where somebody simply be good at their job and there's this quote unquote savings technology it really does change the way the relationship people can have with their wealth or their money without having to revamp the education system yeah well the chase for yield is forcing people again to to reallocate their money to others right mm -hmm. like if you have a sound currency like basically a savings technology where people are able to save their purchasing power over time instead of having to chase that yield in the stock markets uh, via fund managers and what what have you pension funds uh, you basically decrease the amount of decision making and stress right it'd be so incredible if people would just I mean this is what Monsieur touches on if they could just have their time valued in a hard currency that preserves purchasing power over time so my favorite meme on the internet is uh it's a tweet that's screenshotted and it says cnn just said the world is in 217 trillion dollar debt who the fuck do we owe money to the decepticons <laughs> <laughs> right right like the world is in debt and it's just this like incestuous i owe you money you owe me money you know the jo guy down the street owes me money we don't what's going on i mean the future generations of that money, right? It's future production that we're, we're promising. And this is what, I mean, MMT. Uh, it's going to happen. Proponents, say, they'll say, yeah, that's their exact argument. Who we owe it to? We owe it to ourselves. Like, we can just print into oblivion. Um, so I talked to uh, Robert Breedlove about this uh, in the last episode. Um, Hong Kong, essentially mm -hmm. doing helicopter money. Yeah. Right? They literally, the, the part that cracked me up is... Uh, the U.S. based media, mainstream media, is usually using the word or uh, the phrase "cash giveaway" <laughs> in their coverage of this. <laughs> like, what the fuck is going on? Yeah, they're giving each citizen ten thousand Hong Kong dollars, like twelve hundred U.S. dollars equivalent. Seven million people. I mean, by the way, great for the people, right? CZ said this to me. He was like, "Usually, the people don't get it. Usually, the government would print the money and like inject it into the financial system, and somehow the people would never see the benefit." If you're a Hong Kong citizen and you get ten thousand Hong Kong dollars, like that's food, yeah. right? Or that you know that's something that you can actually do, but it's not sustainable. No, not at all. But given the like in two thousand eight, given the choice to, if you were only given two choices, bail out the banks or give money to the people, the people, I would take the latter. Give it to the people because yeah. it's proved. I mean, again, in the last twelve years, there's just been a hijacking of wealth and a and a reallocation of wealth from the poorest to the richest and it's just pure asset flows from the spigot of money creation to financial assets and real estate my my uh big thing lately is i di didn't understand how many leaders in the financial world have been charged with crimes <laughs> like <laughs> jamie diamond <laughs> right uh christine lagarde, christine lagarde. <laughs> like she was well, found guilty and didn't serve any time yeah she well, was at the imf what is the uh what was she charged with so she was uh, convicted. This is a 2016 article. The Inter International Monetary Fund chief at the time, Christine Lagarde, has been convicted over a role in a controversial 400 million pound payment to a businessman. Yeah. They found her guilty of negligence for failing to challenge the state arbitration payout to the <laughs> friend of the former French. What is this? The former uh, French president. And now she's the chairwoman of the ECB. Like. Yeah, she she's one of the most important central bankers in the world now. She was when she was at the IMF too. But again, we live in a two tier justice system. These people live above the law, and then they try to lecture to everybody below them on how they should live their lives. I mean, it's it's right in plain sight. And for this some for some reason, we still pay credence to these people when they are criminals. At the end of the day, this is the reason why I think. Bitcoin is such a no-brainer. I'm trying to pull up this uh, this photo. Um, Her signing the dollar. No, uh, I've seen that one too. But she uh, she went to dinner. I think it's back in December. Let me see if I can find it real quick. But basically, she went to dinner and uh, oh, here it is. So uh, 
The tweet says, I was pleased to invite my new governing council colleagues to join me at an offsite retreat yesterday. We discussed in an open and informal setting the running of the governing council as accompanied by this photo. And there's like 24, 25 people in the photo. There's not a person under the age of what looks like 45 or 50. Every single person's white. <laughs> the people who still have hair have white hair. She's the only woman at the table. And it literally looks like if you just put them in like a villain movie. Yeah, it looks like, <laughs> like, it looks like Austin Powers. <laughs> like <laughs> Dr. Evil has his round table. <laughs> like, and, and they're in a, uh, for those that don't see the photo, they're in this like very magnificent, old school, literally gold trimmed photo, uh, you know, uh, on the wall, uh, big drapes, a big chandelier at the table, etc. And it's just like, I think I might have even tweeted this photo. I've been like, do you trust these people or do you trust math? All right. And like, that's fine. There's plenty of people who say like, oh, I still trust these people. They're human, whatever. But over a long period of time, more people will trust math than any group of humans, right? But this photo just, to me, like hits home so much. Yeah, I mean, again, going back to the comments on a few people trying to micromanage a complex system, Bitcoin fix this this is a huge meme and i believe bitcoin will fix a lot of things it's definitely not a panacea but again it provides the opportunity to develop a new financial system in an emergent fashion like anybody can buy hardware plug in a miner uh mine bitcoin directly they can work for bitcoin directly uh and when they're doing that they're buying into a system that uh, is not controlled in that fashion is bottom up has been bottom up for the first 11 years of its existence and i I would bargain, or excuse me, I would uh, argue that it'll stay that way uh, for quite some time, or forever, hopefully. Um, and again, it's completely, it's an affront to the way things are done now. And we're going to look back, and it's going to be obvious that uh, it was stupid to have, uh, to think that 12 men and women in a room, speaking of the Fed particularly, and then... Uh, Christine Lagarde at the ECB as well, and that group of 25 people to think that they can micromanage a global economy. Like, it's asinine. It doesn't make any sense. And Bitcoin provides the opportunity to opt out of that and say, hey. It doesn't seem crazy if you don't know there's another way. Once you realize there's another way and you understand how the other way works, then it seems insane. Yeah. But it takes a lot. That's the thing with Bitcoin. It's a mind fuck. It takes a while to understand. And that's the going back to financial literacy. People don't know what money is or how the financial system works today so that i think there's a concerted effort to make it that way and but once like nine people out of ten i don't do it that often anymore but when i would ask like is the dollar backed by gold they'd be like yes like people <laughs> a lot of people still think the dollar is backed by gold I, my question is always uh do you, do you understand that the dot like your money gets less valuable every year but dollar backed by gold would seem like that's an even easier layup question. And if nine out of ten are getting that wrong, Jesus. Yeah, but and that's the thing. People do know they they, they don't, know it because prices of the goods. Yeah, go they, up. they they don't can feel the it. They can yeah. feel it. They don't, and they experience it. They just don't know what the cause is. They think corporations are paying them less. And um, <laughs> Joe, are you? Did you pull off the buy Bitcoin? Let's go. Us. I don't know how you just did that. Uh, by, the, by the way, hold on. Time out for a second. Joe has figured out the live streaming, and he's figured out uh, how to put graphics. And now, obviously, uh, we just figured out that Joe knows how to put images. I feel like this is going to go real bad real fast, and he's going to start throwing up things on the screen that we're not paying attention to. Joe, can you pull up a, a picture of uh, the Mexican central banker, Carstens? He's now the head of the BIS. There's a picture of him eating a sandwich at some point. Pull that up. It's the, the epitome of... Uh, of the central banking system, we I know exactly who you're, uh, Augustin Carson Augustin or whatever. Carson. Yeah, like Carson. yeah, I don't know what photo you're talking about, but that I do know. Uh, oh, you'll see yeah. it. Um, do you do you think that Bitcoin is such a big idea? That's why the quote unquote intelligent people like reject the truth, right? And the truth being, Bitcoin is based on verifiable information, right? And what I was saying to Breedlove is like most of these people, and especially in finance, they try to 
find truth or find facts or data in every aspect of their life and all of their work that they do in investing. And then when it comes to Bitcoin, you're like, hey man, you don't have to look very far. Like, here's all the information. Here's the math. <laughs> and they're just like, nah, no way, that doesn't work. Which makes me believe like, no, they do understand the value of it. It just threatens the status quo and therefore they don't wanna. I think that's definitely, uh, that's definitely the case. And then on top of that, it's so much sunk intellectual uh, and financial cost into their careers up to this point. It's hard, mm-hmm. and it's the saying, it's hard to teach a, an old dog new tricks. And again, the, the sunk cost of reputation and capital into the incumbent system is such that it, if they, it is hard for them to admit that something new is here and it may be better. Yeah. It also leads me to think about, um, I don't know, what, do we know what the youngest president ever was? Yeah. In the U.S.? Yeah. It's either JFK or Obama, I imagine, right? Let's see real quick. Hold on. The youngest person to assume the presidency was Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy. He succeeded to the office at the age of 42 years and 320, so basically 43 years old. Uh, the reason why I immediately thought of that is um, if you look at the election now, like everyone's 60 plus years oh old. God. It's cr- you know pretty crazy. Uh, and one of my big themes over the next few years is like there's this rage against not only institutions but also the belief that like you need 40 years of experience in order to do a job and i think we saw this a little bit uh with like congressmen and congresswomen being elected that were in their 30s and and much earlier uh i'm waiting though for like the 35 year old presidential candidate to like show up and just be like fuck all you guys the president's a dying breed I think. I think The Rock's going to be the president one day. Yeah. Only because it is official that the presidency is a popularity contest, and he's the most recognized person. He's got uh, charisma, and he's so physically intimidating that if you put him on a debate state, like Mike Bloomberg, what does Mike Bloomberg say to him? He's literally just looking up <laughs> at a 6'5 guy, right? Even Trump. Trump, I think, is 6'4, right? Yeah. The Rock would just dwarf him. But it's. So, again, going back to like inflection points, like the structure of our government was put in place in 1776 like 200 Mm -hmm. almost 50 years away from that it just uh, the structure of our government is not built for again the way things work today how fast information moves and what what is the function of uh, a congressman a representative Uh, why were they created in the first place they were created because they would show up in a local, or excuse me, a centralized place, D.C., Philadelphia at one point, New York at one point, uh, and basically speak on behalf of their constituents. They they acted as a voice for their constituents because their constituents were not physically able to show up and speak. Now that we have the Internet, that's not the case anymore. People mm-hmm. can speak for themselves immediately and have their voices heard online. Like The, the actual mechanics of uh, of the government officials, I think, uh, and their reason for for being like are made moot today because because of technology. Like we don't need to allocate our voices to politicians, and that's why I think we should. How move. does it change? Uh, you're, you're gonna have to have like a balkanization, right, where things get more localized. Um, I think I think we need to go more local. Mm-hmm. We need to. We can't have the federal government dictating. Uh, in large swaths what everybody across the country and every jurisdiction should do. It just doesn't work that way. It shouldn't work that way. We need to get we need to make the federal government smaller and give states rights uh, uh, more of a try uh, the state level and then from the state level down to the city level and township level. Is part of this that if you go with that message it just doesn't happen. Like if you if you basically ask for permission to some degree, it's really hard to accomplish it. But something like Bitcoin and other pieces of technology that, in a non-violent way, just simply give the power back. Like the technology is the solution rather than trying to operate within the box of yeah. like let's go debate. You know, at the town hall. No, exactly. Like that's, that's why I focus on Bitcoin. I don't watch the debates or anything like that. <laughs> like I think, in the long run, in my life at least. It's going to be more worthwhile to focus on Bitcoin because, again, it, it's, people call it fuck you money because you have it and you can say fuck you. I'm going to do what I want and that will enable that localism that, that I was just talking about, right? Mm-hmm. 
people deciding for themselves to invest in their, their local economies and and again being ground up and a book I just have been reading finished and have been like re-skimming Strong Towns uh, that? it's a book written by a man named Charles Marone uh, he's from Minneapolis and it's an incredible book and again it goes back to time preference and uh, the uh, hasty decisions made for growth at all costs and basically after World War II we went out and built uh, people got away from cities built suburbs and infrastructure outside of cities and we basically turned our backs on hundreds of that or thousands of years of uh, humanity figuring out how to build sustainable cities uh, by trial and error slowly over time and after World War II we had a bunch of money we had the dollar was a reserve currency and we just wanted to experiment with expanding into suburbs and um, into in away from cities and when we did that we didn't realize we were creating like in software people talk about tech debt like uh, if you have too much tech debt you can basically um, uh, hurt your product in the future because you have so many things you have to fix as you try to scale and it can curb scaling at a certain point uh, we have that in America in the form of infrastructure debt. Like we've expanded our infrastructure specifically after World War II in the 60s, 70s. And so you have roads, pipes, Dude, the everything, subway. subway. Shout, shout out to the L not getting <laughs> shut down after the somebody got paid off somewhere, right? But like compare the subway to Japan. Yeah, but we and but outside of the cities, it's even worse where you have like towns just being deserted and as soon as one house, uh, one homeowner decides not to keep up uh, the facade of their house and it goes it goes sort of rotten, it sort of decays the, the value of the houses around it and the neighborhoods die quickly and you have basically a generation's worth of uh, the ability to live in these, these towns and then after 30 years we're finding that a lot of middle America and suburbs are decaying and mm-hmm. That's why you're seeing a lot of people come back to cities and stuff like that. And again, going back to time preference, uh, it was decision made in haste because we thought it was a cool idea at the time, but we weren't thinking about generations ahead of what we would have to do to sort of service uh, and maintenance, maintain all everything that we built. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, and that was allowed to happen basically after we went off the gold standard too well at some point the incentives get so screwed up that people who are sitting in the seat are acting rationally but the long-term impact they don't care about because they're not going to be there yeah exactly they don't they don't answer the the bell if you will right no that's uh i get cheesy with it every once in a while but like i do think we should adopt what's called like a seven generations mentality the Iroquois nation it's debatable whether the, whether they specifically said seven generations, um, but still, I think the concept is good. You should have seven generation mindset where you think about the seven generation ahead of you. Like, mm-hmm. do something yeah, today, term. do something today that would benefit them. And sprawling into like an urban landscape or suburban landscape like we did after World War II proved to only think one generation ahead. Mm-hmm. And we're we're gonna pay the price for that uh especially with demographics turning as well uh pretty pretty it's gonna be a hard price to pay and there's again we're gonna look back in retrospect but like oh we were going through this right now um yeah it's it's happening like i interviewed a guy on the podcast chris arnade um and he wrote a book called dignity where he he was a wall street trader at city and after 08 he decided to become a photojournalist and basically go to middle America where uh, people were voting for Trump and find out why they were voting for Trump. And it's uh, basically the the reason they voted for Trump was because their towns are decaying, all their jobs are shipped away. And it's the pharmacist. It's exactly what you see in the documentary. They're yeah. just getting fucking ravaged. Yeah. And this is a serious conversation we need to have as a country. Like, where the fuck do we want to go? We're on a bike right now. That's the thing. Like... We're, you got to keep going the way it's structured right now. Mm-hmm. And I think we need to have hard conversations of, hey, let's get off the bike. Growth at all costs doesn't make sense. It's not worthwhile. And we need to recalibrate our mindset. I think Bitcoin 
again, I say this a lot, Bitcoin's going to change us more than we change Bitcoin, the protocol. Mm -hmm. It's going to change our mindset and our time preference. And that's why I focus on it, because I think it forces people to think seven generations ahead and lower their time preference. It's kind of like Amazon, right? Where Amazon had this like really, really incredible growth mindset. They basically ran a break even operation, never made money, get as big as they possibly could. And once you hit some kind of growth milestone, it's not that they plateau, but now they're optimizing changes. Now they're, they're creating an incredible amount of cash, right? And it's not so much like growth at all costs is bad, it's growth at all costs at certain times is good. Once you hit some inflection point though, you can't do it forever. And I think we see this with companies, right, in the public markets. I think we see it definitely with private companies that are just burning cash. Um, but we see it with the economy as well. And it's so it's kind of like at some point you go from we got to get from not established to established. Once we're established, then it's all about this long term. How do we stay here forever? Yeah, it's knowing when growth is worthwhile and when. Yeah to put your foot on the brakes, say, hey, we don't need to. Oh, be rational. Oh, yeah. Jesus, that would be a fucking wild idea. We don't need to world. go into debt. To, and that's the thing Chuck talks about in the book, Strong Towns, a lot, is a lot of these towns are just going into debt to keep up maintenance costs, to keep up maintenance of the things they've already built, and then they want to be able to show their constituents that they're growing, so they'll try and expand cities and towns, and they're just adding to that infrastructure deck slowly over time. Joe, and, you got the photo? Let's see. He's going to show us this photo, and then uh, we're uh, – is this the one? Let's see. I'm confident. Joe, Joe is currently uh, pulling up <laughs> Augustine Carson's <laughs> <laughs> eating a sandwich, <laughs> which we're going to see. It's a perf- it's personification of uh, – Central banking. Yeah. Let's see. What uh, – What's your new favorite book? You can't say what you said last time we were waiting. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> is this it? Is this, what, is this a meme? There's multiple ones. Oh, yeah. oh you're going to pull up multiple ones? No, there, was oh, there was multiple ones. Yeah. Man, there's sandwiches everywhere in that photo. <laughs> I, I like, by the way, how you said to Joe, hey, pull up a picture of him eating a sandwich, and Joe pulled up a meme. <laughs> <laughs> The the fact that he pulled up a meme is the personification of this whole uh, fucking operation, right? <laughs> what uh? And I appreciate you putting them over my face in the uh, video too. <laughs> Man, that you know what would be a great segment is to uh, do this, and then we could talk like uh, we were central bankers. Hey, man, you hungry? <laughs> I'm starving. <laughs> Want to print some money? <laughs> what uh? What's your new favorite book uh, other than Strong Towns? Uh, it's an old book. I'm reading Human Action right now by Ludwig von Mises. Mises, Classic. excuse me. Mises. I always fuck that up. Is it Mises? Yeah, pretty sure. I I've, I've been corrected know. in the past. Yeah, well, I, I will um, take your word for it. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Uh, I'm reading that right now. Favorite book? I think I'm going to go back and read Inserto. Um, I, I actually had that on my mind. Shower thoughts recently. Like I should go back and read Full by Randomness and Black Swan. Skin in the game. Um, Dude, he's incredible. Yeah. It's, uh, you want to know what? what I would love to see? I would love to see Naval, Talib, Kathy Wood, and like, I don't know. I'd have to come up with a fourth person. Not even weekly, monthly. And people get a write in, and there's some sort of like voting system of like, here's the most popular questions. And it's almost kind of like the, at least with Naval and Talib for sure, and Kathy I think just has a very different mindset, uh, female perspective, et cetera. They're like the modern day philosophers, right? And you basically are like, what do you guys think? <laughs> <laughs> and just see like, cause, I'm, cause they have such different perspectives than like the everyday person. Yeah, I mean, I'm just fascinated by Nassim, Nassim Taleb, like very, like, I think his writing is so lucid and so clear in the way he explains everything, especially asymmetry and the probabilistic nature of the world and the randomness of the world. And he does a very good job of explaining emergent systems, too, in his series of books via languages and stuff like that and how languages have emerged. Um, 
I would love to pick his brain, uh, particularly about what's going on right now. Like seeing him talk about the coronavirus more recently. Balaji could be another one. Balaji, there. yeah. Um, Scott Adams, another one that could go up there. Scott. Scott, is that the Dilbert guy? Yeah. yeah. Pete, um, did you read uh, Win Bigley? I don't, I don't know. Okay, you got to read. Okay, so this is the one book. Uh, somebody, I, I won't say who told me to read it, but somebody in like the f- uh, investing world told me to read this. And I was like, dude, I'm good. Because I think it literally has a picture of Trump on it. <laughs> and I just thought it was going to be like a super politicized book. But basically what he does is he talks all about like weapons grade persuasion and how Trump very early on he knew, hey, this guy's going to win the presidency. Um and what he and ex, like one of the examples he gives is uh, Hillary Clinton had a whole data driven team around like what their slogan was going to be. So they came up with you know eighty slogans, ran all these tests. Trump walked in a room, they're like, "We need a slogan." He's like, mm, "Make America great again," <laughs> <laughs> right? And then like it works again. He, he like like Dave Portnoy, he, he Trump knows how to lean in when when it's the right time. And that's actually not thinking of somebody you want to hear speak and somebody who's. Uh, very controversial and after watching a lot of his talks I, I sort of don't understand why Steve Bannon like I would like he Dude. he is a very lucid thinker and very lucid explainer of his view of the world um, that is somebody I would love to sit down and talk with as well because I think that was like a the media portrayed him as some like devil psychopath yeah, yeah. Psycho. can I make a guess right now I'm gonna cheat a little I have one piece of information about you but I'm going to guess that the video you watched that changed your mind on him was the real vision interview with Kyle Bass and Steve Bannon. That wasn't, I mean, I've watched that. Um, he actually, there's a, but that wasn't the one that changed your mind. That wasn't the one that changed okay. my mind. I've seen that, but I've, I've been on a Steve Bannon binge, um, the last few months because again, like I was, I caught that he's a alt-right white supremacist. Yeah, yeah. When I watched the Kyle bat, the one that I just told you, that's the one that changed my mind because I was like, holy shit, this dude is fucking smart. Yeah. And he is nothing like what he was being portrayed as. Yeah. And I, I, and if you're out there listening and you think Steve Bannon's the devil, I would I would highly recommend you go watch. He's, he's got, that's the thing, he's got a plethora of hour to two hour long videos mm-hmm. out there where he just explains his view of the world very clearly. And it, it makes sense to me. Like uh, in the last election and, and since Trump's been in office. Russia has been the boogeyman. and He makes a very compelling case that we should be focused more on China. Yeah. Um, so so th- this is, um, all right, this is the last thing we'll talk about and then we'll get the hell out of here. You got to go home, so do I. Um, is this model, this media model of long form conversations, right? Some of the podcasts that, that you or I would do, I didn't understand the power of it until I saw Bernie Sanders go on Joe Rogan. I don't agree with anything Bernie Sanders says. At least I thought before he went on this podcast. I still don't agree with 99% of what Bernie Sanders says for the most part. But I was shocked at the contrast between the way he's portrayed by the media. Even though I get to see him do a debate, an interview, a speech, whatever. And the guy who was answering the questions with Joe for two hours. He was way more intelligent. He was way less crazy. He had thought out his ideas way more than I'd ever thought. You know what I mean? Like all of these things. And it was, damn, we as a society could benefit, one, from just talking to people who we disagree with, et cetera, because obviously that's helpful. But two, the media format's changing. And, like, rather than have all these candidates go on stage and just yell and scream at each other and, like, try to get headlines and dunk on each other, like, basically it's like a virtual dunk on each other, right? Have them just go do, like, a three-hour segment. And it had to be with a Rogan. It could literally just be with somebody from the political media. And just ask them all of the questions and let them talk. And then provide that to people. I bet you that those videos would be the most popular videos this the network's ever played. And the people would actually be more educated about the candidates. Yeah. But I, I don't think the networks want that to happen, right? I think they're trying to push. Of course, you can't. How, how do you sell ads? Right, that, <laughs> and then I do think there's a, like Bernie got fucked over in the last election at the DNC. Yeah, by I the mean DNC. that's pretty well. Like, they're trying accepted. To, it seems point, like right? they're trying to do it again. And I'm like you, like I'm. I don't agree with Bernie's policies at all, but it, it does seem like the uh, the populist movement on the left is behind him, and for some reason the Democratic Party doesn't want him to be. Uh, well, on I, the stage, I I was listening to uh, 
uh, New York Times, The Daily. Um, I, I, somebody had told me, you know, go check this out. Uh, I didn't realize how popular it was. So I listened, the only episode I ever listened to uh, was the other day. Um, and they, they brought a reporter in. He was talking about Bernie Sanders got uh, a visit from the FBI basically saying, hey, like Russia's trying to help your campaign. And I guess uh, at least what the reporter said is Bernie didn't disclose that. He didn't have to, but, but just didn't disclose that. And then it came out uh, that the FBI went and talked to some other campaigns, et cetera. Um, and so somehow in there it got leaked that they went and saw Bernie Sanders a month before. And his whole thing was basically like, of course it got leaked, you know, like a day before the caucus or, or whatever. And at one point, uh, the host of the podcast asked the guy, he goes, well, why does Trump seem to congratulate Bernie Sanders? And he's like, well, because Trump probably thinks he's the weakest candidate. Yeah. <laughs> right? But like, then you go and you see Trump is literally tweeting like, congratulations, Bernie. Good job. <laughs> it's like, what world do we live in? I don't know, man. It's fucking, we live in a weird world. And then going back to like what we said earlier, as individuals like you really need to critically think for yourself like that is going to be imperative moving forward and um how do you how do you filter information like you probably more than most i know do a good job it seems like what's your strategy for filtering information so you read good high quality stuff um other than subscribing to your newsletter (laughs) (laughs) you i put a lot of competing views on the same list i use tweet deck tweet deck is the only way to consume twitter in a a good way in my mind uh, you create lists you throw them up on tweet deck and then within tweet deck you put competing views on these lists and over mm-hmm. time you basically see what people say how it lines up with what actually happens what has happened in the past and then you just develop trust with some people you follow um do you curate them like you're on a list uh for me and then all of a sudden you say something stupid and you kick people off the list or do I, you pretty much keep them i keep them on yeah. uh just because again like Echo chambers are like a big thing and in, in like Bitcoin, Twitter and stuff like that. But uh, just to stay honest, yeah. I think you got you got to know how the other not even the other side. You got to know how everybody's thinking mm-hmm. and then develop your mindset based on your experiences from that. And it takes time, like the filtering. My filtering process took years of building list and sort of uh, understanding the people on that list and how they react to certain events and uh, how correct they were over time. You can, it's just not going to happen overnight. It takes mm-hmm. time. Makes sense. Still believe in aliens? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just checking. All right. What one question do you have for me? Then we can finish this up. Um, but by the way, top trending now on Twitter. Oh, it's promoted. Is this is how we Sonic? I feel like you got to throw a, a final thought about your favorite drive-in fast food uh, sometime next week. But go ahead. What's your question? Chick Fil A. Um, and question. You always put me on the spot with this. Hey, you were talking about like the trend. What are you? What are your thoughts on the trends and uh, like independent media going forward? Oh, I think game over for the big guys. Other than like, the one controversial thought, I think I have. Uh, David Perel came in here, mm-hmm. um, and David he showed me a study. And I'll caveat this because people will freak the fuck out. The data that he showed me says what I'm about to say, but I didn't go see how they calculated it. Whatever. But it looked at the New York Times, uh, and since they installed the hard paywall, the use of very left-leaning language, woke, all of these terms and words, etc., has exploded. I don't think that they're going into an editorial room and being like, "Hey, we should, uh, you know, lean into this," right? But one of the things that he really pushed me to think about it. it was like look like take paywalls at the major media co- corporations we can say that it's still the new york times or whatever but they kind of become these very uh ideological things because if you're now the paying person you're not the advertisers don't pay you pay how many people have the intellectual honesty to keep paying for something they don't agree with not that many right so you almost be like the publisher now is writing for the audience and so what do they do? They lean into, well, we know the audience likes this. So they start to move more, more in that direction. And this was over a couple of months and just the language you use, right? You start talking about certain topics and it kind of pulls the, the thing there. And so I think that one, that means the l- traditional large publishers are going to become looking more like blogger style, opinionated. You're going to try and mimic it. Yeah, like like independent type publishers, but they'll still be the, the large guys. 
Two is you'll see an explosion. Like, you know, Substack obviously I think is those types of tools that will allow people to kind of build their own things, et cetera. Uh, three podcasts. I actually think uh, American citizens are really bad at writing in a highly overgeneralized way. Um, it's much easier to just talk. And so I think you'll continue to see that explosion. Uh, but then the other piece is this idea of like citizen journalism, kind of like what Balaji's done with the coronavirus stuff. People now realize there's a social reward for being the best voice on something, regardless of your position in society. And so you've seen this now with like um, Tim Pool became super popular with all of the like riots and um, and protests and stuff with like the civil rights type stuff. Uh, Balaji's done a great job with coronavirus. Um, I think you're starting to see people say like, I'm personally interested in a topic. Uh, and there's a social reward. Like the guy, uh, you see the guy on the um, the Japanese uh, ship that wouldn't leave. I, I didn't. Was there somebody reporting from there? So dudes I on a cruise jumped off that ship. Dudes on a cruise. Everyone gets coronavirus. Like 600 people got uh, infected. It's or whatever. a terrible quarantine strategy. And he started tweeting or posting or whatever, and started to gain a little bit of fame from it and following. And they came and tried to get everyone who hadn't contra- uh, contracted it yet off the ship, and he wouldn't leave and wouldn't let his wife leave. So he got addicted to the fame. I, I don't know really what was going Stockholm on. Stockholm syndrome. But literally, like he was like, "I'm not leaving. Like, I, like I got a job to do. <laughs> 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 like, I'm about to live stream the coronavirus. It's not worth it, son. Yeah. And so it's just like, now that's like an extreme, you know, example. But like, you almost get this world where like people feel an obligation and they have the tools you see hong, hong kong protests you see people yeah, stepping well, up. the doctor died in china like he felt compelled and crazy he's actually started i mean rest in peace the him stepping up and then being correct the uh ccp making him come out with a statement against what he originally reported and then dying uh when he probably was correct uh warning everybody of coronavirus in december um is really igniting from what I understand, uh, animal spirits within China, people are pissed off that this man who may have been able to not prevent, but, uh, alert at least alert and contain, may have been able to contain the virus, uh, obviously more than they have now at this point. And that's a citizen journalist, a doctor who just felt like he needed to stand up for what he thought was right. One of the things that I started to push myself and I think I'm going to start challenging people with is when you read the news meaning not the individual citizen journalist stuff right mainstream media whatever terminology you want to use historically we've lived our lives default it's true if you switch that not to default it's lo- it's, it's untrue but default this is an opinion I need to investigate true or not true right so kind of like default uh neutral the way you think about the information you consume completely changes yeah this this really hit home for me with the coronavirus particularly like i was out there uh like i i was out there speaking more confidently uh three weeks ago than i am i'm comfortable speaking now i honestly wait why like because like around, you don't know yeah, yeah, yeah. i don't know i honestly don't know what's going on on the ground like the videos of the people welding the door shut like i, I can't corroborate them i haven't been able to find it seems and, like it may be and there's but, contradicting like people are like oh that's my neighborhood and they both say two different things yeah and then i have bitcoin friends in and around china who have said maybe uh the chinese government's overreacting and then you uh then you listen to people saying that the, the numbers being reported are far under what's actually happening. And it's just, again, in the sovereign, or excuse me, in the information age, confusion is going to reign supreme. Mm-hmm. And with coronavirus, I, I'm very confused. Well, and this last thing I'll leave you with is this is all just the actual facts of the information. We're not even talking about doctoring videos or audio, you know what I mean? Where it's like now it goes from confusion to like active disinformation. Mm-hmm we're still just in the confusion phase and I don't fucking know what's going on. You don't know what's going on. Like, I don't think anybody listening to this knows what's going on. So what happens when then we enter a world where people are actively trying to give you Deep false fix. Infor- Yeah. Like yeah. fuck that. <laughs> That's what makes me want to go move to the woods, get a farm, just chill. All right. 
how can people subscribe to the newsletter? Uh, TFTC.io. Um, you can also buy merch there. Yeah, for those that merch. don't know, he has his Sup Freaks hat on. And uh, when we were checking in with security, the security guy downstairs <laughs> immediately, eyes wide, Sup Freaks? <laughs> it's a great conversation starter. Um, best way to subscribe to the newsletter, find me on Twitter, at Marty Bent. I have my pinned tweet there, a link to subscribe. Um, you don't have to subscribe. It's just my weird thoughts on Bitcoin and macro and philosophy um, with a final thought at the end. Joe is a fucking expert. Look, at you got Tales from the Crypt <laughs> logo in the top right. <laughs> yeah. And then the podcast, Tales from Thank you, the Joe. Crypt. I've been crushing it. Got you. I'm telling you, man, he's about to be dangerous. So, look, he's literally got your photo up here. He's got all the fucking information. If uh, if he has another three days with this, I feel like I'm going to come in here and he's going to have a green screen. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to be at the beach. So, all right, man. Listen, thanks so much for coming to do this. I know st- we spent a lot of time talking, but uh, <sighs> hopefully all of you freaks in uh, Marty's world enjoyed this. No, thank you for having me.